And with that, uh, we're going to shift gears now into a different world uh, where we're going to talk a little bit about uh, spatial audio and uh, specifically spatial audio in the browser. And um, if, uh, if you are familiar with the metaverse uh, or with spatial audio, you know how important it is to have um, quality audio and qu quality spatialization uh, in your listening experience, uh, whether you're playing a video game or whether you're, um, whether you're in some type of metaverse, uh, talking to people and interacting with them. Uh, so, uh, so we have the team at Atmoka here uh, who are going to talk a little bit about that space and talk about um, some of the challenges of that space and also a little bit about the exciting stuff that they're doing um, with 3D audio and spatial audio. And with that, I will turn it over to Daniel and Marcus, and I will let you take it away. So uh, welcome. Yeah. Hey, thanks. Thanks for the intro. Uh, I hope that my, my sharing did already work. So yes, you're all good. Okay, perfect. So we, we yeah, just prepared a few slides so that we can yeah show you a bit what, what we are doing. And first of all, we are really happy to be here. So thanks for having us. And yeah, as you mentioned, Daniel and I are here to tell you a bit about Edmoki and our journey so far and also what we have just planned for the future. And first of all, so we are sure that the future of audio is 3D because yeah, that's that's what we are all about. So 3D or spatial audio. And for all who aren't really familiar with the term, um, yeah, we, we have here a, a simplified explanation. So as you know, in the real world or in natural or realistic listening conditions, our ears as the sensors and also our brain allow us to localize sources relative to us with a certain direction and distance. And over time and over listening to yeah, just a lot of different environments, we have also internal references for how it's going to sound in different rooms. For example, we can always assume how a bathroom will sound or, or has to sound. And that's basically all what you can do with spatial audio. You should be able to recreate experiences. And yeah, we would also would like to give the listeners the sense of being actually there in the room, at least acoustically. And yeah, that's what we mean by, by true spatial audio. And in order to make such an illusion or recreation a reality, there are just certain aspects that you need to do right. And we learned about those parameters that are crucial for, for true spatial audio during our, our time at, at university at the IEM in Graz. And yeah, where we worked both as researchers and yeah, we also defined a few of those parameters and tried to, to build tools that, that build on that, that knowledge. So the, the parameters that, especially when, when talking about spatial audio over headphones, um, are three that we believe are, are the most crucial or, or the most important. Um, the first is quite obvious, you have to do the direction right, meaning that the uh, elevation or azimuth or yeah, let's do it in Cartesian coordinates, you just have to get the direction in the relative to you as a listener right. And the simplest way to recreate such a direction would be to yeah, record with microphones in, in the ears, which, which then is called something like binaural audio. That's not really generic, doesn't allow us to, to recreate or, or to produce, produce spatial audio. Therefore, um, yeah, there's the, the model of your ears and your torso, which are the HRTFs in this case. So the head related transfer function, they encode time differences, level differences, and also direction dependent filtering. I'm sure most of you will know about that, but we can yeah, also dive a bit deeper into that a bit later. And yeah, let's say HRTFs are matched and you can make the direction, then you need to do something in order to get a externalized sound image. And yeah, that is probably so the only way and most convenient ways to do it with reflections or some sort of, of decorrelation of the ear signal. So every real room or environment has um, reflections and the direct to diffuse ratio is also the, the great indicator for distance, which yeah means by, by controlling the direct to diffuse um, factor, you can 
yeah, just get distance and externalization. And that's also related to, to how your ear signals are correlated or in a diffuse sound field, they are decorrelated. And yeah, one really, really important thing when talking about spatial audio over headphones is that it has to be reactive. You have to do dynamic binaural rendering. Otherwise it will be something like a yeah, stereo effect probably. And to come up with that, you also need to, to have really low latency because yeah, as a listener, you can always distinguish if latency is, is too high. And yeah, like dogs are moving their ears for better hearing, we humans are moving our, our heads. And this helps us a lot, especially if you want to distinguish sources that are coming from the front or from the back. So yeah, that's what we believe. Um, I'm sure that a few of you will see that personalization is not really in there. And yeah, we know that it, it can be important, but there are also a lot of studies that show if you, if you have good generic HRTFs um, that are high fee, meaning that you also reproduce low frequency content. If you have room and spatial reverb on it and you have dynamic rendering, then the, the personalization makes just a few percent of, of maybe immersion or, or that you could make it better. Yes. Okay. Um, during our time at university and also after that, we, we took that knowledge and then came up with a perceptual optimization strategy um, that yeah, helped us to, to come up with a specialization and rendering engine that can reduce the, the complexity that's typically yeah, involved in spatial audio by, yeah, let's say 89% while keeping the perceptual quality really, really high. So here are yeah, some examples from, from listening experiments for different room sizes and also for turning um, head tracking on and off. And basically what, what this shall show you is that when, when just taking perceptual optimization um, yeah, or favor that um, over a physical um, modulation of, of what you want to hear, you can reduce complexity a lot and that makes spatial audio also possible on, on platforms with, yeah, just not that high amount of, of computational, um, yeah, resources. Okay, um, we strongly believe that perceptual quality matters when it comes to, to audio. Um, and we also like to stress that spatial audio is not always spatial audio. So there are, especially since, since it became somehow um, native to, to iOS and to the Mac apps, but also before that and, and in the browser. So there are just a few marketing terms that are now there with spatial audio that's basically just stereo panning or, or only distance attenuation. So yeah, for us, true spatial audio needs to involve all the, all the free parameters that we, yeah, or I showed before. Okay, um, you may know from us that we did something before we did it, Moki. Um, as I mentioned, we've been at the at the IEM, and um, yeah, we tried to bring there some tools to the community that can help to build and produce spatial audio. And I think now the IEM plugin suite is one of the most heavily used toolkits for for producing spatial audio. Daniel was was heavily involved in in making them happen. And yeah, there are just a lot of different tools. We have something for spatializing for maybe even dynamics. You can do some conversions. You have a loudspeaker rendering approach that's based on, on Alrad, a binaural rendering engine, and yeah, just a just lot of, of, of different tools. And those tools um, were obviously the, the basis or the foundation um, for what we started. Um, we, of course, heavily extended that and also yeah, did our own research and optimizations. Um, but in general, the functionality and, and the tech stack that we have at Moki covers pretty much the entire production chain. So we have, yeah, just also stuff for, for recording and upmixing and other conversion tools. But right now we are strongly focusing on, on the spatializer, on, on adding some effects, reverb and on the rendering and so for rendering to headphones and to, to various loudspeakers. And we also 
follow our vision, which is to bring true spatial audio to the people and promote also a workflow that fosters creativity. And with, with that in mind, we came up with two products that we have released or are releasing right now or that we are promoting or pilot testing, let's call it like that. And that's the, the web SDK and the, the native SDK. Um, where the, the web SDK is, is really branded to be the audio engine for, for the metaverse. It's built in, in WebAssembly and yeah, just works with a lot of different streaming um, services with, with voice chats. And what was really important to us is that's highly reactive to, to user input and to interaction um, with, with your avatars or, or whatever game logic. Um, and the other thing is the, the native SDK um, is optimized for mobile and desktop applications. And the cool thing that we did or, or tried to do is that both SDKs um, follow the same concepts for developers. They give you the same experience as a user over different platforms. And, and also they include the same tools for, for the sound designer. So yeah. If you decide to go with our SDKs, then the, the experience as a developer, user, and sound designer should be should be the same across all all platforms. Um, yeah, for for this talk and also for what we are doing, we we strongly focus on the web. And yeah, we asked us a few questions before we started that, or, or had good reasons to to go to the web at this stage. So we experienced uh, a general trend towards web applications. So um, a lot of desktop applications now only run in the browser or additionally run in the browser, but but we strongly believe that this trend is, is going to last. Um, however, we, we didn't really yeah, see or hear a lot of, of spatial audio applications and solutions um, in, in the browser yet. And so the questions that came up and then we asked us were probably if it's too hard to use or if the experience is is too different across browsers, maybe it's even too hard to produce or, or to sign, design audio for it. And maybe also the iteration circles could be too long. So going back and forth between sound designer and web developer, product manager and so on. And yeah, those are a question that we tried to, to answer with, with our web SDK or to overcome at least, yeah. And another reason why we went for, for the web SDK now is that it's with, with WebAssembly, it really makes a lot of sense because it's, it's technically feasible. Um, in general, spatial audio is, is on the sweep. So at least un, until I think 2020 when, when Apple released it. And another thing that, that yeah, pushed us towards the web is, is obviously the trend or, or the buzz about the metaverse, whatever that that will be or it's going to be um, if it's going to happen then sound is definitely considered to be a crucial part of it because there there will be no yeah real immersion if if one of your major senses like hearing is just off and, and doesn't yeah fit to to what you're seeing or just isn't realistic or, or natural so that have been reasons for us to go to the web to build our web sdk and yeah, the features that we are having now in, in the web SDK allows you to um, spatialize voice and, and any, any sound objects in, in all three dimensions. Um, yeah, we believe that you can really spatialize a really, really high number. With our SDK, um, we have um, a reverb engine that is adjustable, can help you to, to build rooms and to make yeah, certain effects go from a big hall to a conference room or, or whatever. Um, we have an externalizer engine in there and, and brand new hot hot and occlusion feature, but I'm, I'm probably going to show you that later or, or Danny will talk about that. And um, yeah, as mentioned before, dynamic rendering is crucial. So it's quite obvious for us that it has to be in there and um, yeah, we also decided to render directly on the client to keep latency really, really short and that are the, the basic features, which brings me also to the USBs, which are yeah quite interlinked, I'd say. So as mentioned before in the questions that we ask us, um, our, our stuff is cross browser um, consistent, meaning that it supports all major browsers, sounds the same. We 
build on, on high performance in, in WebAssembly, also our algorithms before we went to WebAssembly are highly optimized in terms of the perceptual quality. Um, we integrate with modern web interfaces like FreeJS or, or Babylon JS. Um, we support various um, WebRTC um, voice chat or, or streaming providers like yeah, Agora Live Switch or Twilio, for example, where we also offer integration examples. And due to our choice to render directly in the browser and not to, to send the tracking data or movements to the server and also do the mixing of audio on the server, we have the, the lowest motion to, to phonon latency with our SDK. And uh, the last thing that's here on the slide are the developer tools, which are really dear to us because those are the tools that help to bridge the gap between um, developers and, and sound designers so that you really can yeah, just shorten integration times and cycles a lot. And that means that now Daniel will, will take over and yeah, show you how to work with the web SDK and, and give a few, a few more examples. And I think I have to activate or let you take over my slides. Yes, please. <laughs> So hi everyone, I'm Daniel. Um, I'm in charge of development and all the programming stuff at, at Moki. Um, I'll give you a short overview and some code examples of, uh, and which should show you how to how to use the, uh, the the SDK. So let me see if I can control the slides. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So before we dive into into code, uh, I want to to show you some basic concepts and um, maybe even something about the Web Audio API in case you aren't familiar. So the the Atmoki Web SDK is an is a module for the Web Audio API and it works in the audio context which uh, comes with it. In the audio context, you generally have a couple of or even even many audio nodes. You can, can connect them together and eventually send them to the destination, which is basically the audio sync of your browser. So the sounds get heard after that. And you see here we have, um, as except for an example, uh, three audio sources. Each of them has a gain, a panel, and then they are combined some together into the audio destination. And you, so. And you see it can get very crowdy once you want features like a reverb send, uh, send bus because you need an extra gain for every, every source to control the send level, send it to a reverb node and that output back to the, to the destination. So it can get very crowdy and it's, it's fun to play around, but it, it costs a lot of time to, to set it up, um, especially if you want to recreate the same experience or a similar experience every time. So you mostly have this setup right here. With the uh, Atmoki Web SDK, we provide a, only a, a few classes which you can use and reduce that complexity. For example, we have the source class which wraps around audio nodes you can use as an input. And these audio nodes are sent to our renderer class. The renderer takes care um, of specialization, of a spatial reverb, and also takes care about the logic behind uh, the att attenuation curve. So that means basically when a source um, goes away from the listener, how does its volume um, change with that distance? That's all inside of our, our renderer class. And with it also the listener, which is the, the main, yeah, it's basically the listener of the scene. Every, everything is rendered in relative to, to the listener. So each source has a, has different properties like gain. The position of the source can be changed. You have a reverb send level you can set. And uh, with today's release, you even get occlusion. So you can simulate a source behind a wall in a room while the listener's outside uh, and stuff like that. And the listener, of course, has also a position positioning system. And it, yeah, for the reactivity, uh, this listener can look into different directions and the sound field is rendered accordingly. So before we, the next slide is code, I promise. Um, we actually provide you with three main classes. That's the, the manager, the renderer, and the source class. 
uh, the manager is here to to set up an audio context because you need to to add our module into the the web audio api's audio context this is also managed by the manager hence the name um, it also takes care of loading the correct module because there are browsers outside uh, which don't support SIMD in their WebAssembly implementation and others who do. And according to that, at runtime, we decide, shall we load the SIMD optimized one or the non-SIMD optimized one? Okay, once the audio context is prepared, we create a renderer of it. We tell it um, the number of sources we want to have. And the render basically is a remote control to the WebAssembly backend in the in, our, in the audio worklet. That's basically the the rendering backend of the Web Audio API. And that renderer can can also create sources for you. And with those sources, you can control and and set specific properties on it. Okay, so it's time for for code actually. So it's for me as a developer quite easy. I'm not sure if if you think the same, but I've I've got a another trick in my pocket for later, but let's let's dive into this example for now. So uh, the Web SDK is an uh, ES6 module. You basically just import the classes you need here, manager, renderer, and source. Um, then you have some placeholders for the renderer and the source we want to use later. We create a manager in the audio context. The manager is a, a Tmoki class. The audio context is built in into the browser. And we tell the, the manager to prepare the audio context. And once that's done, we do like our setup code. So the manager is told to create a renderer. We got that in, in line number 10. We connect the renderer to the context audio destination. And we, we don't do this automatically, although in most use cases, you will have that line of code. But for example, you could have a use case where you have, want to have a dynamic processor in between the specialization and the um, audio playback. Then we tell the renderer to create an audio source. We set an input to it. And the input in this example is just a, an oscillator which plays sound. Uh, and you actually can use every input you have or every audio note in the audio context. So it can be like a sound creation source like here. It can be an, an audio player where you load audio from a file. Uh, or even a, a WebRTC media stream you get from like a, a voice communication provider. And in this example, we set the source position to uh, X, Y, Z coordinates three to one. But with the source, you can do even more. So you have the, the input setter, um, that's obvious, also the position, uh, but you can change the gain in both, both linear and in decibels. Um, same with the reverb send, we got a, a spatial audio reverb engine in the renderer, so you get true spatial reverb. So not just stereo or something, but it's really an immersive reverb engine in there. As I said, with today's release, the occlusion. So in this case, uh, like the source could be behind a hedge or something, not sure. Um, and you have something like uh, the attenuation curve index because you can define several attenuation curves. And we will see that in a, in a later video where you can group sources together and assign them to the, to the same attenuation curve because sometimes it makes sense to have like um, the communication participants to hear over a, a further distance and you can define like smaller, smaller effects in a, in a vicinity in a specific area of your game. And the attenuation curve, it's basically a, a piecewise linear curve, uh, which on the x-axis, you have the distance of a source to the listener, and on the y-axis, the, the volume you want the source to have for a certain distance. And you can imagine a piecewise linear um, curve is quite hard or cumbersome to, to define purely in code. Um, and that's that's why we, we came up with developer tools to, to give the developer or the sound designer something they can use interactively. And let me show you like an example. On the right side, you got our source viewer. It's basically a pop-up window which pops up, uses all the information stored in the renderer instance. And you can see where sources are placed visually. You can turn around, see how the, the listener walks through the scene. If you have implemented like a, a game-like uh, movement system in there, and this, even, even if you have, if you don't have any visuals in your application, 
you can open the, the source visualizer during your development stage and, and check if, if everything is specialized to the position you would like to have. Okay, let's get to the attenuation curve designer. That's also a pop-up which you can use during development. Of course, you can get rid of that during um, your production phase uh, because it is only necessary to, to use it or to give the, the sound designer the opportunity during the like dialing in the perfect sound process. So the attenuation curve designer, let me stop the video. I hope it works. Nice. So on the x-axis, as I, as I said, you see the distance of specific sources. Um, to the listener, like the congas here are, are very close and the river sounds are, are further apart. And I should be able to set the audio. So for example, in, in that movement, I simply dragged a curve with a piecewise linear uh, attenuation curve, uh, a point of that curve. And you, you saw that the river sounds, which are further apart, were now way louder than, than before. And that tool um, lets you export code. Code a sound designer can send to the developer, or the developer can just copy and paste, uh, paste it into the their production code. And now the attenuation curve is updated because no one wants to to set those points like in code. It's not really fun. Okay, let's see if we can get to the next slide. Yeah. Okay. So you saw we, we simplified the setup in terms of number of audio nodes you have to create. Uh, but still, that piece of code we have here is basically full of boilerplate code because, of course, you need a renderer. Of course, you need a couple of sources. You will need a manager in an audio context and do all that setup here. And we even want to, to simplify that. It's not a lot of code you need here, but we thought it can get better. And this is why we uh, came up with our audio scene builder. Once I get to the next slide. Oh yeah, here, okay. And all that code can be reduced to simply a one-liner basically next to the import um, new audio scene. Here you got a, a config file, it's a JSON in, in that um, particular example. And you can even pass um, options for the audio context. You don't have to, but you can, and for example, in that, that example. And it's quite similar to, to OR and, and um, EL's um, workflow of, hey, just use this, um, this JSON file, dial in some numbers, change it, and you see the results. Um, and it's, it's quite fun to see that it's not only used in a web, like in our web SDK, but also during uh, plugin development. And this should speed up the, the iteration um, you have in your, your typical development workflow quite a lot. So um, what you of course need is the JSON file you see here on the right. Um, it has a list of sources in, in this particular instance, you have like one source, it's a shaker. You tell it whether the path is, it's an MP3 in that, in that case. Um, the type of the source is an audio file. So with that comes also a little uh, some some lines further down the road. There is should stop playing and looping. So these are particular pro properties you have for an audio file, and you have an initial situ um, position of the source, and also parameters like reverb synth. and you can also add their occlusion or, or anything else. So next to it you get a the attenuation curves. It's only one here because not so much space on the screen. Um, but you can define as many as you like. Same with the sources. So, and, and this file doesn't need to be a JSON file. It can also be a, a JavaScript uh, object. So you can have a separate file holding this object and tell the sound designer, hey, if you want to change the experience, use this file, change the numbers, um, press refresh in the browser, and should work. So uh, here, like a like a workflow outline. Um, we, we heard from a sound designer that their workflow was very cumbersome because they had to create new sounds, send it to the developer. The developer has to had to implement it in code, um, compile it, send it to a staging server. The sound designer opened the staging, the, the app, um, and found, okay, there he, he or she has to, to make some changes. And this iteration is like one iteration is a day or even longer. And we want to, to make that iteration circle way, way shorter. 
So our our workflow or proposed workflow would be a sound designer is in his or her DAW. He or she uses our audio plugin, which allows for specialization of sound sources the same way as in the browser. So he or she can listen to the experience, even though it's it's not it, it doesn't have to to be code like JavaScript code or TypeScript code or anything in the browser. And once he or she is satisfied with the results, export the scene, export the audio, JSON file and audio files sent to the developer. Developer drops this line of code, new audio scene, config.json, and maybe puts it on the staging server together with our developer tools. So um, the sound designer could dial in the attenuation curve parameters, send them back to the developer, and we go to deployment and have a finished web experience in hopefully a very very short time. Okay, and that's basically all I have to say uh, from the development side of things. Um, back that's to Mark. That's not true. That's not true. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no. Um, maybe we can can do the the last part together, or, or I start with it, but you can just sure. yeah, jump in if something comes up. So. Um, you probably yeah ask yourself what, what are the the actual use cases for for our spatial audio web SDK and also for spatial audio on the browser and then we also um, yeah had to think about that because as as mentioned before there aren't really that many applications in the web to use spatial audio um, at least not as we we intended it to be used and therefore we came up with our own demo um, which is here seen as a as a quick screenshot and we tried to put all the the use cases that we could imagine on on this map but i will probably walk you through the use cases one by one um one use case that's not covered is obviously gaming because our entire demo is is something like a, a game where you can walk around and and explore a scene um acoustically and other use cases that yeah come to mind um, is to use spatial audio for virtual meetings and for, for social audio. Um, yeah, there is this thing called um, binaural unmasking or cocktail party effect or, or however you might call it. If you if you listen with both ears and you have a yeah, spatial audio representation of the scene, you, you can just um, hear people better or, or understand them. And it's also a nice thing to reduce listening fatigue if you are having having long meetings and yeah one part of, of our demo is this meeting area um, I'll try to unmute it and so that you can just listen to it how it's going to sound in our demo it seems like it even works in the browser yeah it does cool they even made an interactive demo Fresh. shall we jump in definitely can you send me an invite sure cool see ya hey I was just talking to Chris about Chris? the Smokey Spatial Audio oh. SDK Yes, seems like it even works in the browser. Yeah, it does. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you you get it. Um, that's fresh. The, the, yeah, fresh. <laughs> the use case for for the meeting scenario. Um, then we have uh, a thing that's called the uh, the big hall where we use just a, a different reverb engine and and that room is just to intended to show that you can do um concerts, you can do virtual events, you can make some sound installations. And yeah, we are also actively looking for other artists or sound designers that that maybe want to yeah compose something for a big hall or just to to present the work they did. And again, here I'm going to play you the the quick demo. Okay. Um, yeah, and another use case. So there are also some some trees and and birds on our map. Um, is when you just want to escape a hot day at the office, or yeah, just want to have something that that's more natural or or relaxing. So in our demo, we we put some trees, birds, um, to also show off the the three D capabilities of our web SDK. So. The birds are are somewhere in the trees above you, and and there is also a river that you can hear in in the distance. And again, the playback. Mm 
Okay, something that I, I forgot to mention, um, this probably works best on, on headphones. So it's it's intended to be listened to on, on headphones because it's yeah, binaural audio. Yeah, I think we should have said that. Yeah. But yeah it's on YouTube, so scroll back like a minute or something, get your headphones, yeah. and you get the experience. And it's great that you are talking right now because now there is your, your newest feature, the occlusion. Maybe yes. you can tell us something about that. Okay, so in a, in a first version of the demo, we simply had those rooms. And once we entered the rooms, we, we simply muted all these sources, which are outside and vice versa. So uh, but the ex exclu uh, not exclusion feature, but occlusion feature, um, we wanted to simulate how a sound, a sound would sound like when it's outside a room. Like Marcus is sitting right next to me behind this wall, and he's all mumbly and very damp, damp in sounds. And basically, we, we did the same here. Once you're in the room, for example, the, the bongos you will hear in a second uh, will be lower in volume and more dampened, like a, a high, high frequency roll off. And the same once the listener is outside in the big hall concert audio sources will, will sound similar. So let's give it a try. Yeah, and the cool thing is it's just one value you have to dial in. It's between zero and one. And you can bind this together with like your game engine. Like if you shoot rays and you see, okay, this uh, this sound source is actually uh, obstructed by, an, by a wall or another object. So you can define uh, like a value for each wall, uh, add it up to the, the maximum amount of, of one in that case for the occlusion and you very quickly get the experience of a, of a sound source being shielded. And the cool thing is uh, that happens after the reverb sends. So the reverb will still be bright and have basically the same reverb send level, um, no matter what occlusion you have. And this makes it um, more realistic, of course. Nice, which, which brings us to the, to the what next, which can also cover Daniel, I think. Yeah, I can. Um, so let, let's do reverb zones last because that's like my favorite feature I want to talk about. Um, we from the audio world have a, a very strange coordinate system, I think, with the X axis pointing forward, the Y axis pointing to your left and set pointing upwards. Uh, I know every everyone who, who does OpenGL or, or even in, in choose with X, Y going in different directions. Um, we say, oh man, we are crazy. For now, we have it that way. So um, we know it's it can be problematic for different game engines. Uh, even with the game engine we use in demo, we have to yeah negate and, and switch out coordinates. Uh, what we want to add as a feature here is like, you can say, okay, I'm coming from an OpenGL world or something else. And we do the conversions internally for you. Um, the the yeah, also big thing for maybe for sound designers and the, for example, uh, especially for the workflow with behind um, workflow with sound designers and developers are the DAW plugins we want to have. So we want sound designers to create those experience experiences in their DAW so they can adjust effects or compression or anything else um, before they export the sounds and listen to it like a monitoring plugin in the in the DAW they have. And also like the ability to export those, hey, go back, <laughs> to um, export those uh, scenes you can uh, then load with the audio scene builder. Then right now we only output binary uh, audio signals. So you need to use headphones. It of course also works with uh, loudspeaker playback. For example, here on my laptop, uh, the sounds seem to come uh, quite quite far left and far right uh, from my from the actual speakers, so it gives the illusion as well. Um, but what we want to provide is loudspeaker rendering, so you have like a, a rendering for stereo, but also one for 5.1, 7.1, all those standard layouts. 
And now let's get to the reverb zones. Um, right now, we only have one reverb you can use. Uh, and of course, if you want to have different spaces, like a, a small room uh, coupled to a, a bigger hall or bigger concert hall next to it, you want to have different reverbs. And you also want them to only be fed by sources which are in the room. And this is what we want to accomplish with uh, reverb zones. So if you create one sound in, in one room and another in the, the other one, it doesn't depend on where the listener is, but where the sound is. So in, in earlier game engines, you had the problem um, once the, the player goes into a like a big room um, and someone like shoots a, a gun or something in a smaller room, it's you get that cathedral effect, but it doesn't make sense because the actual sound is in a different room. Um, this is what we want to to uh, provide here, reverb zones, which are source dependent, basically. Nice. So that that brings us to the what now. So also as a yeah, please note that I'm I'm not sure if the the sound from the demos or clips that I I played back for you really really came across as as two channel or as binaural audio. So we tested it in Zoom and it it worked, I think. So I'm not sure how it's going to sound in, in the YouTube live stream, but that brings me to the thing that's most important to us, which would be for you to, to check out our, our demo. It's public available. Um, you can test it, explore it, and also can, can test it with voice chat integration if you want. And it would just be great to, to get the feedback of the community because it helps us just to, to improve. Um, also, we, yeah, think that there could be a few projects that that benefit from from spatial audio, or if you have feature requests, um, yeah, it would just be great to to get in touch, have a discussion, and then to see what what we can build and where we can integrate spatial audio in in the future or in the even coming upcoming weeks. So so we are up for for pretty yeah sophisticated solutions and also yeah want to get some some fun out of that testing phase and integration phase and i think that brings us to the end which is the the slide where you can get some resources so you can check out our docs our web page and also the demo which is demo.moki.com and yeah thanks again for for having us josh and if there are any questions we're happy to start a discussion Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much, Marcus and Daniel. Uh, fantastic presentation. And uh, we do have two questions so far. So if anybody else has any questions, please feel free to ask them now. Uh, one question is from Ismar, who asks, for occlusion, I see there's a single float that serves as an occlusion factor. Does that cover most cases? Or are there cases where you'd want to occlude based on a 3D shape? Um, yeah, the, the occlusion gave me some headaches because I, I had to, to choose between like a very sophisticated model where you can dial in all the parameters you want to have and like, a, like the simplicity to use it. And uh, I thought, we, we don't know what, what game engine you will use or even if you have your own, own one with rake casting and checking what object is, in, is between the source and the listener. And for now, we thought the easiest way is to have like a zero to one ranged value you can use. And you can even change the mapping basically on your side. So you can lean it towards the zero or more towards the one uh, as you go and have your own system behind the occlusion. So our web SDK is not geometry aware because with that, we would have you to rely on our physics engine or, or the, the object models in there. Um, we wanted to, to make it as usable as possible in, in every kind of um, framework you want to use. And we are also um, currently in the integration phase for most of those uh, platforms. For example, 3GS will be the next demo we have. We have projects with uh, Play Canvas. Our demo is written with Phaser IO, Phaser JS, something like that. Um, yeah, so that's basically the long answer to that question. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, Ismar, if you need any more clarification, please uh, feel free to let us know. And he had one more question, what, uh, which was, what kind of speakers and slash headphones does it work on? Um, but I imagine it would work, work on any speaker with headphones, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, it's I think it's a, a big debate what headphones you you could use or you should use. Uh, in research, you often see those what, what are they called the AKG K1000. So they are basically two rectangular shaped things you have yeah. in it and with a distance to your ears. I think the same thing is true with the Wolf Index speakers. They have a distance, mm -hmm. so you don't get the feeling of you're inside your headphones because you hear the, the real room and have like this augmented feeling in there. Um, but most of the time we have either like AirPods from Apple, it works with them. You have the usual studio headphones like the DT770, DT770, the uh, some AKG models. So it, it works with, with everything. You get, of course, a different tone, but that's also true for music playback. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But in general, it's really interesting because it's also what, what you are expecting as a listener. So I think we have learned that if you put on headphones, that that has a, a very specific specific sound. So headphone sound is always quite different to to listening on on speakers. And I think also for spatial audio, you you can definitely learn it, or if you experience it a few more times, like. Like we, for example, did during during research where you listen to the same spatial audio scene and HRTFs like a thousand times, then everything else that comes out of headphones is is a, seems to be a bit off. So yeah, in general, it's not depending on on hardware, but yeah, we are aware that there are certain other aspects like room diversion effects. If you are sitting in a different listening room where you as a listener would expect to be specific reverb or, or reflections and you are simulating different ones with your spatial audio playback then it also can seem to be a bit off but yeah that's all about expectation and yeah nice cool thank you uh very much daniel and marcus um great uh and where where can people oh uh <coughs> um there is one more question that just came through um this is from Jas, who asks, does the SDK deal with psychoacoustic phenomena? I'm not sure what that is, but maybe you know. Um, in the sense that it that it covers, yeah, HRTFs and ITDs and ILDs and interaural cross correlation. So so that sort of stuff is is inherent because yeah, our rendering is based based on using HRTFs and also three-dimensional reflections and, and reverb engines and externalization. So in that sense, definitely, uh, yes. I'm not sure if, if, he was, if he or she was referring to maybe Doppler effects or something like that, but yeah. Okay. What we, what we can add to our final rendering is that we want to, to have like a rendering engine which is as transparent as possible. So there are many renderers out there which have a certain sound uh, that can be good, but can also be bad, especially if the, the sound designer has a different sound in mind. Um, ours, we, we, we optimize it in a way that it's, it's so-called diffuse field equalized. So if you listen to all the directions it supports, um, it's basically flat. So you don't get any coloration you don't want. You of course have direction dependent coloration because that's yeah. what our ears do. Um, yeah, but it should be as as easy to use and not add too much coloration. Yeah. Also very interesting. I think that lots of binaural renderer come from where you yeah intended to to render for loudspeakers and then people just make a virtualization of that speaker setup. And if you do that. Um, yeah, obviously you always have have the room and also some sort of speaker characteristics probably on it. Um, but the real cool thing is if you build a renderer that um, has the goal to to output the best possible binaural um, signal, then you can make a lot more more tweaks and make it way more more efficient and also more realistic in terms of when you rotate your head. But if you virtualize a speaker setup and 
even if you are in in the sweet spot of that speaker setup due to the time differences of the of the speakers and if they are not on the same radius you always have some comp filtering going on if you rotate your head and yeah if you just go for binaural from from the beginning then you can make a lot of yeah quality improvements here amazing cool thank you very much daniel and marcus um thanks for having us yes thank yeah thank you and um thank you as as well to Eyal and Or. Uh, I think Or had to run away. Um, yeah, uh, thank you. That was awesome. I really enjoyed this. Yeah, thank you. really a lot of fun. Um, and a uh, big shout out to Rachel. I hope everything is okay with her as well. She had to run early, mm -hmm. unfortunately, but we'll be seeing her uh, for sure on our next meetup, which is going to be the 11th, the 11th of October, which is every second Tuesday of the month. And uh, we have some special guests already planned. Um, uh, and uh, once again, if you haven't joined our audio programming Discord, uh, be sure to join us. You can join on the audioprogrammer.com forward slash community. Uh, and with that, we'll be signing off. Um, thank you very much to all of you and to everybody who's been watching. And um, if there's nothing else, I will see you all next month. Cool. All right. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Bye. Have a great evening and thanks again you too speak soon <laughs>